Well, welcome to another episode of The Platform, and super fun to have Mark Baker on the show. Um, I used to live in New York a long time ago, and I'd see him on his push bike, riding around, hustling things up for different events and clubs. He was uh, pretty much the best at what he did. In fact, he got the moniker, the king of the clubs. So you think it's easy? Does anybody think it's going to be easy to be the best at something? Do you think that there aren't 100,000 other people in New York City who want to be king of clubs? You think it's glamorous? Sure, it's glamorous. If I got cars and toys and houses in the Hamptons, you bet I fucking do. But do I drive my bicycle and bust my ass six days a week? You bet I do. Do I go home and cry at night? You bet I fucking do. Do I go home and get the shit kicked out of me by my girlfriend because she just can't understand why I can't give her as much love as I give everybody else? You fucking betcha. It's torture. Everything you dreamed of is right there at, the, at your fingertips. But the bottom line is, is that just when you get it, they're walking out the door. Because who the fuck wants to lead this life? That's the price I pay to be the king of clubs. So you could only imagine the stories and the lifestyle and uh, we've caught up a few times over the years actually in Bali and that's where he is right now. Uh, he pulled out his laptop, jumped on Skype and we filmed this. It's so good to have you on the show and I'm not sure if you remember when we caught up for lunch a few years ago in Bali but you told me your story and at that time I was thinking, oh my God, this has got to be a book and the show that I do is about stories so man, I'd love you to share a bit of it like the Mark Baker story growing up in the UK. Yes. I don't know how much time do we have. I'm be here <laughs> Let's go, man. Until tomorrow with that one. But um, oh gosh, it's been it's been a, it's been quite a ride. And uh, you know, you know, I think it's uh, life's a journey um, with all its ups and downs. And uh, you know, and, and mine has been certainly a colourful one. Um, I started. You know, I was born in Brighton, England, uh, in in in, uh, in the early '60s. Um, you know, it was a pretty pretty rough neighbourhood. Uh, you know. Brighton's a, Brighton's a colorful place with a lot of colorful characters. Um, you know, my dad had died when I was young and my mum was trying to support me and my brother. You know, she was away a lot of the time, so I was kind of left to my own devices. Not always a good idea, you know, leave, leaving, your, leaving your boys on their own. But, um, no, I, 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 you know, a colorful childhood. I joined a circus, you know, <laughs> the circus when I was nine. That ain't as glamorous as what it sounds, by the way, because, you know, the circus is also a pretty rough place for... A lot of people want to, who want to just disappear and hide and end up in the circus. But, you know, there was wonderful moments for that, too. So I was with a circus for a couple of years. We traveled all over. Um, then I was kind of taken home and went to a couple of special schools. <laughs> <laughs> they were approved, so they were good. <laughs> and, um, and then kind of gave all up around 14, and, uh, and I started skateboarding. And uh, back then, you know, there was the whole California craze. Um, we were in Brighton trying to emulate these California Guys, you know, Dogtown was was the, was the main group that I identified with, and as uh, skating grew in England, um, I, and I was you know quite competitive, and I was starting to compete, and I was on the street all the time because right? I wasn't going to school, so I was just skateboarding, and then uh, and then and then uh, gosh, then we got better. England, you know, British skaters got better. You know, skateboarding became a worldwide phenomenon, and um, and and. Just a guy called Tony Alva, who was uh, one of the, the, the main Dogtown guys, came on tour to England. We met. Uh, our managers hooked up, and you know, and then we went on tour together. And then when he went back to California, I went back with him. He stayed in California, so I kind of was adopted by those Dogtown boys. And, and uh, the next few years were just fucking crazy. When you see footage of you above the rim of a pool in midair right. on a board, I mean, right. it's great that you land them. I'm just wondering, like looking back, how many times you didn't land it, and you must have <laughs> got some serious injuries. Every, my fuck, every, every bone in my body is all broken and and, uh, and and smashed up from skating. Sure, yeah. Look, you know, there was nobody knew that you could do vertical. You know, we, everyone was skating on the streets, and you know, and it was going from here to here to here to here, and then it went vertical. Um, then we started. Well, but actually, you know, the Dogtown boys get credit for the, for the beginning of it, but, you know, we all, we all followed and emulated. And, and uh, empty swimming pools, ramps, anything that had a bank on it, you know, we were going we to ride. Um, and then it just got extreme. Then they started building skate parks. And, and, you know, we were always pushing. We were always pushing each other and pushing the limit, obviously, to, you know, to be better and crazier and wilder. And, 
and Mad Dog Alvin and Mad Mark Baker on tour was quite a quite a fun, fucking fun fun <laughs> uh, But yeah, oh gosh, I mean, you know, some of those tricks. There's 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 no room for there's no room for mistake in those tricks. So if you're going to fully commit to doing a trick like an area where you where you go up the side of the pool, you uh, you you grab the board and you go out of the top of the pool and you come back in. Well, that's all good unless those two back wheels hang up on the lip of the pool and then you're just like going 15 feet on your face exactly. or on your wrists or your knees. And oh gosh, yeah, so many so many so many accidents, so many broken wrists and ribs and and collarbones and, and all of that. And of course, we weren't wearing helmets half the time. So, oh my god, so there's a, there's gnarly tricks. You know, there's a trick called a, a roll in where you you're basically rolling around the top of the of the pool and then you just roll into the pool. I mean, that's just from from here to there on your head every time if you don't if you don't commit to it. So so we were pretty pretty daredevil back then. But but now, if you look and I think what the what the great thing about skateboarding is and how it's influenced not just skate not just skateboarding but every, pretty much every action sport every trick you're seeing now ollie air tapping the board hand plants slides board slides rock and rolls all of, everything was created from skateboarding and uh, i gotta say i think you know me and a crew of, crew of guys pretty much invented pretty much all of those tricks so so, so it's not just the skating it's the the lifestyle it's the it's the, it's the clothing it's you know skateboarding influence I mean, this was what seventy eight. I was going six seventy eight and touring there. Eight eight nine eight two eighteen. It's like forty years ago. <laughs> now you can see how it's influenced uh, everything. Unfortunately, um, there's someone very special who, who's up here in Uluwatu in Bali, which is where we are right now, everyone. Um, who's here right now? Is a fucking legend called Steve Olson. He was world champion, one of the best skaters, greatest skaters of all time. And his son Alex Olson is also now. Um, like one of the greats, um, and doing all kinds of amazing things. So, wow. and they just surfing. So I'm sorry you missed them. But no, no, that's okay, man. Well, I take my hat off to you guys because what you did back in the day set the tone, and uh, you're all legends. I remember yeah, now you were telling me. You know, some of us aren't here. Some, you know. I mean, you know, also, you know, just to add on to that, look, you know, you had a sport. I think what the incredible thing about skating, you took a, you took a. I mean, basically, skating is a street, is a street, it's a street thing, you know. Right. And, you know, what you've done is you took a lot of kids that could potentially get in trouble. I mean, you know, I'm a classic example of that. I was heading completely down the wrong street. And skateboarding came along, so I just put all my energies and all these street kids put all their energies into skateboarding. And that kept them out of trouble. You know, we had something to focus on, something to, to, to look forward to. And, uh, I mean, you know, I think skateboarding has been an incredible sport. Now it's in the Olympics. It's coming up. But uh, but it's, it's certainly... You know, there's there's no there's no there's no color barrier in skateboarding or, or, or religious culture. Everybody skateboards, and skateboarding is back again in a big way now. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a great sport. Well, mate, I remember another thing you were t- telling me at the lunch was about some of your early jobs when you went to New York, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can repeat them or not, but I I would love to ask you about them. Well, yeah, it was skateboarding and and uh, and. Uh, I, you know, I was back in England, you know, wondering what the fuck to do with my life. I was probably about to get into a whole bunch of trouble again, you know, because I mean, there was no, I mean, it wasn't really work. There was just so many villains around, and I, you just, you know, by, by association, you became a villain. Right. And I didn't want to get into trouble. I really had my once span of trouble somewhere in those years, and uh, didn't want to go back to that place. So, um, so uh, yeah, I had a, I, somehow I had a Porsche car and. I of course been banned from driving, <laughs> for driving too fast, and all the rest of it. And um, so I got on holiday one year. I met these guys from New York, and they said, "Come, you've got to come visit us." So I ended up shipping my car over there, and the dollar pound exchange rate was pretty good. So I sold my car in in, in New York for a bunch of money. And when I got to New York, it was just like, "Oh, dude, I'm never leaving. This is this is my fucking town." <laughs> so, and, um, so. So yeah, I was driving around and I had a Rolls Royce at that point in New York, and then I lost everything again as I do every few years, and um, and had to end up working. I was you know I was collecting you know I was up in some of the worst neighborhoods. I started off delivering furniture actually. I was delivering furniture, and uh, and then we started doing jewelry and TVs, and then I had to go and get them back when they weren't paying. <laughs> I was going in, and this is the height of the crack epidemic. So me and this crazy ex-Israeli paratrooper were driving, and I, had, I think I still had a Porsche there too. So we were driving around the South Bronx and Harlem, 
fucking Brooklyn, one of the worst neighborhoods imaginable, in the worst period in those neighborhoods when it was like crack central. And we were the only two white kids up there. Right? And they were like, who the fuck are these guys? So we were like fucking shootouts every week. And fucking drug busts that were going on. We were in the middle of fucking gunfights with SWAT teams and fucking, you know, crips and bloods and all kinds wow. of I was nuts. Um, yeah, it's going to make, make a great movie. It would be. <laughs> and then, you know, then I was like, well, you know, so I started working as a, as a restaurant I used to go to all the time. It was really popular. And then um, I ended up working there. As, I, said, I went there as a waiter. So I started working as a waiter. And, uh, uh, yeah, I got, I got shot in the leg one day, and that was quite enough. I don't want to cry, but, you know, doing repo stuff. So I stopped doing repossessions. And so I got to work as a waiter. <laughs> And that was really funny. So it was just, I'd make up all these personalities, you know, to go to every table. I'd be Fritz, the German waiter from Hamburg. <laughs> and then I'd be, you know, then I'd be the Frenchie, you know, was it? So I'd, just, I'd the Irish waiter. I had all these personas. And everyone thought it was quite funny. Um, so I met a bunch of celebs uh, and made good friends with them. And, and I was out partying every night. And, um, you know, I was like, fuck, you know, I'm, I'm the man, you know, I'm the fucking, I know everybody, so I'm going to throw a big party. So I, you know, when, it was actually uh, one of the. I think it was Keith Richards had a club down on the low, low east side, and uh, so I, you know, I made my little flyers, and it was a Monday night, a rainy Monday night. And I don't worry, I know so many people, there thousands of people coming back. I had to block off the whole block. I said, you don't understand what's going to happen. There's going to be some fucking people coming to block barricades, get extra security, and. Uh, you know, 10 o'clock that night, 11 o'clock, probably like three people. <laughs> I was the only one. <laughs> I was hiding under the DJ booth. Because <laughs> I was just, I can't, like, I mean, there were tumbleweeds in this club. Nobody came. Wow. And I, that was probably the, the lowest point I've ever been in my life. That was just like, I, and, you know, when you, take, when you throw a party, you know, it's like someone doing a dinner at home. You know, you want to make it special. And, you, you know, these things, are, you take these things to heart. So, so I hid under the DJ booth in a fucking... On the box for like hours until everyone gone. It was the worst experience when I said, "That's never going to happen again. I'm never ever going to feel like that." And you know, six months, a year later, I started doing bigger parties, and then the rest is history. How long? How long did it take from that moment hiding away under a DJ booth to be considered to, like the king of clubs and like killing it? I did. I did. I think I did about a year. I, I, I really, I went away, I went back to the drawing board. And, you know, this is a time before we had phones. Right. There was no phones, I, no no, uh, no cell phones. And, yeah. I mean, I was doing invitations by fax machine. You know, I had, like, all these supermodels standing in my loft, in one of my lofts in New York, and, you know, and they couldn't pay the rent back then when they were starting. So I just had me you a know, Friday was fax day. So they'd all just be smoking weed and fucking running around <laughs> in the panties in the apartment. And, and just, like, we had, like, six fax machines lined up. So they'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be sitting on the phone, banging phones all day long. Um, no, I did it. I did it right. The next one and, and, and the next big party I did had uh, had three thousand people on an aircraft carrier on the west side of the uh, on the USS Intrepid. Wow. Um, I conned the. I think it was the uh, who were the guys you know the Navy that uh, let let us do a party on the on their on their yeah. flight deck, and I said wow. you know we're going to call it take a trip on a ship because everybody was on mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I got, we, we weren't allowed to do that again, but we stopped, we got a reputation for doing outrageous parties, like Lower East Side, Haunted House, Halloweens, lots of celebs, lots of supermodels. And then I ended up, you know, my first restaurant, and it was just that time when, you know, the whole supermodel thing was coming in, and, you know, and all the girls were kind of friends from Europe, um, and, you know, they met Joe Pesci and Bobby De Niro, Jack Nicholson, and Oliver Stone, all those guys. And then we had Naomi, you know, all the supermodels too, so... So it was just it was just that it was just right place, right time, and uh, my first club there, called, restaurant club called Metro, just became ground zero for debauchery in Manhattan. Um, it was so good, you know. We were shutting down Fifth Avenue because there was just so many people, three, four thousand people showing up. Wow! And um, so we got shut down, <laughs> and I lost everything again. <laughs> Since the opening of Studio Fifty Four in the late nineteen seventies. New York City has epitomized the world of celebrity-driven nightclub chic. In the last 15 years, one nightclub promoter more than any other has defined what it is to be fabulous. Before anybody in New York City was, was being fabulous, there was Mark Baker. I think he's the best in his field. We get popcorn? Yeah, popcorn is for free. He brings beautiful people and a sort of energy that nobody else can replace. This is a man who lives life to the full. 
He does what a lot of us think we would like to do. He does. Marx has always been somebody who I think has succeeded and had the reputation that he's had because he's very real. Mark's daytime work involves the organization and promotion of a constant stream of nightclubs and celebrity events. But in the evening, he also has to host them. Can you imagine being the daughter of Donald Trump? That's funny. Which is so normal, isn't it? I'm as normal as you can get going to school on a private jet every morning. Mark is about to put his reputation on the line by throwing the most ambitious party of his whole career. At a cost of $25,000 per head, he's flying in 1,000 of his A-list friends to his exclusive Millennium Beach Party on the tropical island of Bali. If we don't get that money there to Paris today, then we don't get our champagne, then we have nothing at midnight, which means I'm going to have 500 people looking to fucking lynch me in Bali from a tree by my neck because of this shit. Hello? So yeah. yeah, can you just say Mark's on the phone? Can I? Does he want me to do a dinner tonight or is he full up for dinner? If he wants me to do, do my job, he's got to call me back. And he doesn't call me back. So, I mean, if I don't hear from him, I'm not doing a fucking dinner, right? So, Dan, I'm sorry, man. I got to go to fucking work, all right? I just need you to say yes or no. It's not that fucking difficult, is it? What? I'm telling you, I've left three messages there. You don't call me back, Dan. And my message through your man there is, do you want me to do a dinner or are you full up for dinner? That's it. It's quite simple. You really don't, huh? No, Dan, after leaving four messages, all right, it's, it's now 4.20 in the afternoon. I've been calling you all day to get an answer from you. No one calls me back. And I say to your guy, he said he's busy. He's going to call you. I said, just ask him if he wants me to do a dinner or not. And then you don't get on the phone. I mean, I mean come on, guy. Get out, work with me here. There's some really great footage and clips, I think it's even on your website, where it shows like a, sort of the, the running and putting a party together and, and you get pretty stressed. So it's pretty stressful, yeah? It's, it's, it's beyond stressful, you know, I mean, uh, you know, people, people see a party, I mean, it's, it's a little easier now, you know, 58 or 57 or whatever, you know, now I don't stress so much, but it's a stress, you know, you, you, you throw a party, you want people to come and, and you know, and, and even though you don't want to take it personally, you do take it personally and you want it to be a success. And, um, it certainly gets easier over the years, but, but it's tough, you know, the club business is, and the party business is a really hard business and, you know, and it's 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 almost like a it's a sick addiction to, right. to working a you know a, a week a month two months sometimes on an event with all the the design of the invitations the production the DJs the music the sound the theme how you deliver I mean we were you know back in the right now of course you just tap a couple of buttons and reach five million people you know but back then we were hand making invitations I'd have chicks dressed up in whatever outfits we wanted a minute and they were hand delivering I, I was making music videos on tapes back then wow. and we would make 2,000 tapes and hand deliver the tapes <laughs> and just said watch me and I thought they were about to be extorted but uh, <laughs> you know, and but you know but you know people get a, you know something substantial like that and they don't do that anymore you know now they just you know it's another fucking invite on your on your on your email right. you, know, you know when you got some chick dressed up it was like you know whoever, you know, Alice in Wonderland, like handing you a, 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 a video, and we've made the video, so we made the production to make, you know, that, that has, a, has a statement. And, uh, and then, you know, and then it, yeah, there's the stress on the door and who can't get in and who wants a table and do you know who I am? And no, I don't know who you are, which, which is why you're outside, not inside. And, 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 and but there's, there's this moment, you know, there's that moment, especially, you know, up in the DJ booth where you're just looking out and you've got thousands of people just, bouncing and, and then you blast them with the nitrous and the sounds and and uh yeah i got goosebumps for thinking about it you know, <laughs> that's that, awesome that, man uh, that five minutes kind of makes it all worthwhile and then the next day you've got you know your angry girlfriends your broken marriages your fucking fights your you know the booze and yeah. you know the drugs and all the rest of it so you know, you know it's a tough business well, that's, oh. that's what i was going to ask you it's like an incredible contrast in new york and and how do you find like your life lifestyle in Bali comparing to that and the Balinese people? Bali is 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 I can't even tell you. I mean, I've been here six years now. You know, I, I've got uh, you know we've got farms, and I have a, 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 I started this new juice company and a restaurant in Changu. Um, I jumped on board with Omnia, you know, Cliff Club as a as, as a, a consigliere. Don't call me that. You know, <laughs> the, all, the kids, all the kids who used you know who used to work with us. 
and for us in New York and our clubs uh, started, you know, a promotion company. And they, they were like, you know, Vegas guys and kids, and they, they done really well. You know, yeah. they, when we started promoting, there were like five of us, four of us. And there's now, you know, we're about four million wow. around the world. There's, there's some, I mean, everyone's a promoter these days, you know. Yeah. But we started that business, and, and, and we, the business of promotion. And these guys just took it to another level, and, you know, especially when you got Las Vegas and the very kind of, and we, st- we started bottle service in New York as well, so. So, you know, the whole bottle thing took off. I think, you know, they abused it a bit. <laughs> like your minimum spend is 50 bottles at your table. I mean, that's wow. just ridiculous. But they made money. They made big money. We made money. Yeah. But these guys, and um, so all this young generation was coming up. And I was like, you know, it's, it's not a good look, you know, like 50 year old guy hanging out in my closet with 22 year old girls. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's not a good look. But every time I look at your Facebook, I see you there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they look good, but it's not a good look, yeah. But yeah. Um, so I was just like, yeah, get bars. So I went to bar, came here, and then uh, went away and just, just found this sort of new lifestyle. But I'm not completely out of the picture. Omni is great. I love them because, you know, it's a day club. It's not a night club. Yeah. I'm up at five every morning. I've got my wolf. Wolfie, come here. You want to say hi? Yeah, let's see, Wolfie. Wolfie, come here. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Come here. This is, <laughs> this is the reason why I did. That is Mr. Wolf. Hi, Mr. Wolf. Hello. <laughs> Oh, hey, Wolfie. Nice, just brushed his teeth. He's got nice big teeth. He's uh, he's my everything. He's having a nap right now. <laughs> he's my everything. So I'm just surrounded by animals. And, you know, Bali kind of has a way of kind of, you know, Bali can completely fucking bring you to your knees um, mentally, physically, psychologically. And, uh, or, and, and it can build you up into the... the into the most wonderful place. So I'm, I'm probably happier than I've ever been right now, which is amazing. You know, happy, happily ever after is looking quite po- quite possible at the moment. Awesome, man. Po- well, I wanted to ask you about Australia. Like, do you get out here much? And, and what do you, what do you think of the nightlife in Australia at its at its time? I thought they I thought they'd shut it all down in Australia. It pretty much has, but we're talking back in the day. <laughs> um, I, yeah, my bro- I got an older brother who lives in uh, Brisbane, so I go and see him. Um, yeah, no, okay, I, I definitely I was looking to. Australia, you know, when I first got here, I was looking to, to roll out clubs all over Asia um, and Australia, um, you know, with, with all the look, all the relationships and brands and friendships, and DJs that, that I built over over 35 years in the, in the business. You know, everyone was like, where, where are you going? <laughs> Asia? <laughs> oh. um, you know, do they have food? <laughs> do, they, do, they have, do they have electricity there? Wow. You know, I had no idea what's about to go down. I saw what was going to happen in Asia. It was obvious because, yeah. you know, America's getting saturated. The festival scene was getting saturated, and uh, Asia just was was like two, two and a half, three years behind. So I was like, I got to go put my foot down there. And Singapore's going to break out; they're going to have big clubs soon. Yeah. And big guys in the business were like, Mark, I don't know, man, Asia, I don't know. You know, we got so much going on in America. I said, I said, guys, like bite your tongue because I'm gonna, you're going to become this. And, and now they're all coming. You know, yeah. Marquee up in Singapore. You got, I mean, you got Marquee down in Sydney. Um, you know, you know, yeah, this Cafe de Mars about to open here. Omni is just probably one of the most, one of the most visual, one of the best clubs in the world right now. It's a day club, but but, but again, our whole scene here in Bali, and this is this is kind of important, and this is a really good thing actually. You know, is is that we're not a drug fueled industry here. You know, and, and I keep coming back to the drugs, and, you know, because it it, it, it it plays a major part. Our partying here in Bali. And our lifestyle here in Bali is actually really healthy. You know, I mean, we, 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 you've got to be healthy. You've got to look good because that fat, white, nasty party and five-day look isn't a good look. You know, and, and and you've got a lot of beautiful people who are moving to Bali now, and it's a, you know it's a sexy environment. And people want people want to look good and they want to feel good, but they're not, they don't want to be virgins either. So they want to party, but they don't want to do it till five o'clock in the morning. Again, yeah. So that's this proliferation of uh, of day clubs here now. Where people, you know, you start in the afternoon, you get, you know, tipsy, you get drunk, but you're not sitting there like, you know, doing gear till five, <laughs> till five in the morning, and then you know, for, for two days in a row, because we've got pretty tough sentences here. Yeah. So, how, as opposed to Ibiza, Tulum, Mykonos, and all the other New York, London, you know, yeah. where we're just like cocaine central. Yeah. Um, we have a we have a pretty pretty drug free environment here, which which is great. Yeah. You know? Yeah, trust me, I've, I've done them all. Yeah, all mate, I can't wait to get back there and have a night out there. But, uh, mate, I wanted to ask you about if you could give yourself advice, yeah. or what would you say to young people out there, like with a dream to chase or something like that? If you, the things you've learned, what would you? But never give up. Never give up. Be persistent. You know, if uh, if one door closes, fucking knock it down. Find another door. You know, you never. You just 
you can't give up. You know, if you've got a dream, especially in the environment that's changed now around the world. I mean, this is really, look, that whole carrot on a stick. You know, if you work for 50 weeks a year, you'll get your picket fence. And that's a bunch of bollocks. And, uh, you know, you've got to be street smart. You've got to, you've got to have, you've got to be go-get. You've got to be ethical. You know, don't, you know, don't win at others' expense. You know, that will just, that will just fuck your longevity. You know, go to work. Do the work. Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, take a couple on the chin. Take many on the chin. Lose. You'll lose every. I've lost everything five times. You know, I come back with something new. Um, you've got to keep going. There's nobody wins by giving up. You know, so so that's what persistence. You know, be politely persistent. You know, if if you can't get to someone one way, get to them another way. You know, and and and, and you know these days there's so many ways now. In some ways, I think it's more complicated. But in other ways, it's so you can work from anywhere now. You know, find you find your angle, find your game, and don't give up. And but at the same time. You know, life is meant to, you know, you have to work hard, but at the same time, you know, you, you've got to try and enjoy your, your life as well. You know, quality of life is, is I mean, as you know, you know, quality of life here is, is beyond. Um, you know, enjoy your life, you know, put a smile out there, put good energy out there. It, it will come back. It will, you know, get, got a couple of bucks, give one away. It's, it's okay. You know, awesome, it's Mark. So good to have you on the show, bro. It's uh, great to catch up and looking forward to hanging out in Bali. And uh, great, and if you guys are coming here, I'm going to give a little plug. Come to Beach Garden in the Royce, one of our restaurants in Changu. Super good, super healthy, lots of nice people there. And, of course, Omnia up on the cliff um, and a bunch more. Take care, be well. Good to speak to you, mate, and uh, we'll talk about that book and that movie later. All right, mate. Cheers, guys. Good Take care. Mark. So there you go. Super fun to have him on the show. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the platform. Yeah.